Well, I'm a pet for he's a... Oh, hi, this is Explore the World's Greatest Canadian Wizard, and I want to start today's edition of Mything Persons with a quote from Scripture. That's right, this may not be your Scripture, but it certainly is Scripture to somewhere close to half of humanity, so this may mean something to some of you that have a metaphysical bent, or bent in some other way. <laughs> this is from Isaiah 55, 11. This is the ASV version, the American Standard Bible version. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Well, I think that's a very good place to begin this conversation about the origin of angels. Many people believe angels have independent existence of the higher power, the highest power, so to speak, the architect of the universe to some of you, the cosmic muffin to those of you that never found an anchor. <laughs> so you just flew. Anyway, the idea that there are servants to those cosmic level beings, or that cosmic level being, that has been enfleshed, I'm going to use that word again, so I'm using it advisedly here, in the concept of the angel, the diva, the higher being that's not godlike, but it's better than we are, right? Well, better than you are, I'm actually are. Uh, but that creature, that, that not quite godlike creature, probably immortal, very long lived, it has magical power, some kind of powers we don't understand. The Clark theorem clearly states that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic to the rubes. That's us. Yeah. For all we know, the angels in scripture might have just been humanoids that were capable of counting to 21 without taking their pants off. Think about what I'm saying. Maybe if you had a big lighter, people thought you were pretty powerful. So there are degrees of things. But what I want to talk about now is a separate concept. Not that the angels were a cloud of cherubic, uh, seraphic, right? Thronic, power, -ic, ergic, ergodic, there it is, power. Creatures that flew around with God in the in the cosmic nothing before the what physicists call the Big Bang, right? The creation of the universe. Let there be, let there be light that we can see, which means expansion and transparency. There, are, there are things that people talk about. You know, it's a, just a tenth of a second that the universe existed beyond its initial confinement, whatever that was, <laughs> existed in a teeny little period of time called the inflationary epoch, where whew, the universe got so big so fast that the quark glue on soup that it was expanded into the point where you could transmit energy through it, where individual particles could form, you know, long lived particles like, oh, I don't know, protons and neutrons and stuff, yeah, yeah, things that'll matter later on, yeah, because you're made out of them, but what science never told you is that you're also made out of dark matter, oh, I can there's some dark energy trying to get rid of it. So anyway, when you look at the origins of angels, though, there's no reason for um, a creator spirit, a creator urge, a creator entity, a creative moment to be attended with a flock of angels. That's a later concept. So the, so the idea is where did the idea of angels come from and where did the concept, I'm using these words again and again, I'm feeling kind of stupid today, but you get the idea, of an angelic host around the Lord of all come from? Well, a lot of places. One is we look into the heavens, we see the sun, and it is surrounded by stars. We see them when it goes down, we see them before it comes up. But the sun is the major glow in the center of all these teeny twinkly stars and the few that go the wrong direction. They're called planets. You astronomers, excuse me, I'm talking about angels, but this is a moment that should be said, right? Oh, well, Pluto is a planet. Pluto is not a planet. Pluto is never a planet. You called Pluto a planet because you wanted funding. Percival, did you not? Get this. Planet is a specific term called, that means wanderers in Greek. The planets were the bright, sparkly lights in the sky that weren't the sun that moved against 
the general motion of all the other sparkly bits. The wanderers. That's because of parallax. We're very close to them and we're racing around inside of them mostly. And so we see the hair, 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 hair. And we see them in different aspects as they go around. Or Venus, where we see um, phases like we do of the moon. Yeah, this is stuff. And I'm glad I'm talking about planets for a moment here. Because the very ancient concepts coming to us through the Hebrew tradition, through the Jewish tradition, the oral history, that is probably the longest unbroken oral, his oral history of all humanity. So whether you like it or don't, it is significant culturally significant to every single human culture. Whew. And their idea was ancient times before they codified it into the Torah, into the Pentateuch, into the, you know, into the law, the books of Moses. So before that happened, they had this concept that the wanderers had to, had to have a reason for wandering. Don't we all? Yeah. And so they thought that there were these creatures. Each one uh, was Pop was peopled or was inhabited by or controlled by an entity far beyond us, right? And when we started to name these things in our different languages, we named them things that are today synonymous with what we think of as the ancient gods of mythology. Those are one form of angels. Saturn was a Jewish angel. Mars was a Jewish angel by its own name, by its Hebrew name. It's Aramaic name. See what I mean? And in Egypt, they were also godlike entities that could move against the pattern of all the cosmos. Not quite godlike necessarily, because as we started to move toward monotheism as a concept, where there was one uber god, and then everything else was, you know, punching a clock or staring up in awe, right? Or going, why me? Why me? Why my wife? Why? You know. We do a lot of that. I will too. <laughs> Believe me, I've lost lovers and it's a terrible pain. So, but these creatures were distinct and individual and they lived on the planets, the wanderers. The, the cosmic entities were powerful enough to move against the tide that moved everything else. Wow, how cool is that? And that's where the concept of angels come from in scripture. However, as I read when I started here, there's this Isaiah 55, 11, that seems to me to be very clear in its intent and message. Of course, we all say that about scripture. We're all a bunch of idiots because God doesn't speak to us directly. We get these writings and nobody says, God's going to clear that up for you. We're all praying like hell. We say, oh, we know better because we're praying more than the other guy. No, we're not. He's praying just as hard as we are for the truth. And if he varies, that means neither one of us has the truth, most likely. But the way I look at it, that Isaiah 55, 11 is pretty cool. It is God himself speaking when he says that his words go forth to do a purpose, to perform a purpose, a task, and they do not return to him void from that purpose or task. In other words, that purpose or task is completed. It does not say anything about what happens to them afterward. But the impression is given that God's word is manifest into physical effects in the real universe. A machine, helpful robot. Your barking dog that starts like pushing you away just before the roadway collapses. You're The creature that makes Uranus move against the cosmic tide. Ooh. The creature that hurls thunderbolts from heaven at us. Meteors. Oh. So we attribute these to cosmic entities of various levels, right? Because as religions develop, they are accretionists. They build up a body of stories that they try to make into a, con uh, into a coherent um, story, yeah, a complete novel about how this all came about. They are, all the mythological traditions are exactly like science. They are attempts to explain observable phenomena with the tools at hand. Those that don't get that don't understand either science or mythology. That's why I'm your friend Eshkelar, 
because I love you and I'm going to teach you that stuff. Yeah, so when you're in a cosmic court, you will be standing there with aplomb and savoir faire. And they'll be like, oh, who's the cool guy over in the corner that the, that the evil retribution ain't coming to? That'll be your old pal Hushkalar. So, in my view and in my experience, the angels are literally God's thoughts in flesh. And they can be anything, look like anything. And that very well explains the idea that God is surrounded in heaven, in his dwelling place, by angels that are not the least bit human. They have multiple, like, multiples of two or five wings. They have multiples of two or five or seven eyes. They're not like humans, not a bit. If you stood beside one, you wouldn't be thinking, oh, pretty. You'd be like, oh, 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 oh just before your heart burst. They're freaky, man. So thrones and powers, and you know. What we think of as the powerful angels, according to ancient tradition, are the weakest of angels. The angels and archangels are the bottom tiers of angels. Up top, you have seraphim and cherubim, and you have the powers and the thrones. And the, see what I mean? We don't talk about that because we like to strip that stuff down because we're going to make a cartoon out of it. Cartoons are for kids, and so we make it simplified. And then the adults watching it, because they need entertained too, start thinking in these simplified terms, and they no longer understand the gestalt of their cultures, of their cultural imprinting and background. How can you leave something that you can't see? I know, why would I want to, Eshkelar? Everybody asks me that question just before the comet hits. Remember, Eshkelar told you that. So, when you start feeling enlightened one day, you'll think like, damn, if that old guy didn't have something going, oh no, look up, because the comet's coming. That's true. So in the meantime, angels don't have to be individual creatures that existed before the universe. They are literally the words of God in flesh, sent to do a purpose, and to that purpose they are assigned, and that purpose they accomplish, they do not return to him void. I love that concept, All right? Void of their purpose, no, no they complete that purpose. Which brings us up to a further line of inquiry, which is, well, then what happens then? Is an angel only a manifestation for a brief purpose and then it devolves back into the cosmic union? Is an angel a separate personality and entity that goes on beyond its use, its immediate utility? Perhaps God sends it to other uses and utilities. Perhaps he now looks at a cloud of his thoughts and flesh that are all standing around him existing as if he is the sun and they are plants photosynthesizing from his glory and, and they're all hoping please ask me to do something sir please please send me into the world so i can fulfill my purpose again imagine that imagine the line of angels hoping god will notice them wow so anyway this is Eshkor. i thought you guys might like to know where angels come from and uh, there you go there's the origin of the concept through our common Judeo-Christio-Islamic uh, heritage and also various peoples of other books have the same concept for pretty much the same reason. And I think Isaiah 55.11 cuts to the chase very well. I don't usually quote scripture, not anybody's, but you know, that was worthy. Ah. This has been your old pal Eshkelar. Missing persons, the origins, the purpose of angels. Thank you very much.